everybody. Thanks very much for joining this session on the UK's role in global science and research and Horizon Europe participation. So a couple of introductory words about the EU-UK forum. What is it? So this is a forum that aims to facilitate and nurture a constructive and informed dialogue between the UK and its European neighbours, whatever the outcome of the current negotiations. So it's non-partisan and is designed like it is today to be a platform for discussion, debate and information exchange. And we very much welcome the insights, expertise and ideas, not just of the panellists, but from all of you that have uh, joined the webinar. Uh, housekeeping points, you can use on the right hand side of the screen, the chat area to chat with each other uh, throughout the sessions. And you can also use this to ask the speakers questions and I'll pick those questions up uh, as you post them. You can keep out an eye on live tweets from the session using, strangely enough, the Twitter tab. And uh, you can contact the organizers if you need any further support. Uh, please feel free to do that. We have two really brilliant panelists lined up. It's a real pleasure to introduce them. We have Sir Adrian Smith. He is president of the Royal Society. Uh, Adrian, you started your term on the 30th of November 2020, so you've had a year to understand what you have to do now, I guess. Uh, you're also director and chief executive of the Turing Institute, uh, which is the UK National Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. Uh, you're an eminent UK mathematician and uh, an expert on statistics and very specific sort of statistics. You can explain that better than me if the audience asks, I think. We have another very eminent mathematician, so Professor Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, and uh, he is currently uh, honorary professor at the Institut des Hautes Études Scientifiques uh, in, in France. I think you're here today, Jean-Pierre, because you were ERC president, so that's the European Research Council president, from 2014 to 2019, and then actually you stayed on until 2021. I'm going to describe you as one of France's most eminent mathematicians, one of Europe's most eminent mathematicians, because you have such a long list of uh, uh, jobs and functions that you have fulfilled. You started your career in the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, and then you proceeded in parallel and subsequently to many, many very eminent positions indeed. Um, I draw to the attention of the audience that you have linkages through uh, doctorates to Keio University in Japan, uh, Nankai University in China, and the University of Edinburgh. So you are global as well as being French and European, just like Adrian is global as well as being uh, British, I guess. I'm going to start by asking Adrian to kick off with his introductory comments and then Jean-Pierre will follow and then we will open it right up. So Adrian, take it away. Whatever you want to say, you say. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really pleased to be here discussing the UK's role in global science and research. Engagement with the EU and participation in Horizon Europe are really important parts of that, of course. So the importance of investment in science has been shown only too starkly during the pandemic. Pandemic, And as we confront climate change, biodiversity loss, and many other issues of, of great matter to humanity, these can only really be addressed through global action and investment in science and research. Uh, from the point of view of today's discussion, it's important to stress that we're building on a strong and solid foundation, and science is an area where the UK and EU have worked positively and consistently over the years together. Uh, and of course, as a member state, the UK was active in developing the UK framework programs, and both the UK and wider science communities are keen to see these strong links and ties uh, continue. So, because we want to see continued UK engagement with European science, whatever the political situation, 
And this is why we have been committed to and calling for full UK association to be uh, to Horizon Europe and to be concluded as swiftly as possible. Uh, but beyond Horizon Europe, we also want to see the UK playing an active role in, in Euratom and Copernicus. Uh, building on areas of constructive engagement, these are really not things that need to be or should be politicized. They're not political issues. And the current uncertainty is eating away at the solid foundations of collaboration. So a question for all of us, I think, is how can we can make sure that the political situation does not affect our scientific relationships and that UK association to Horizon Europe does not become a victor, victim of wider political agenda and disagreements. Uh, over the past five years in the UK, the Royal Society has outlined the many reasons why UK association to Horizon Europe is good both for the UK and European science. We believe that international partnerships and collaborations that could be made in, in, in Horizon Europe, flexibility and strength of the programs, as well as the consistent funding streams and the strength of the EU as a scientific actor, all make this a no-brainer that we should be part of it. And the other way around, globally competitive UK science base, forward-looking research culture, our own approach to funding and developing innovative ideas as well as our shared values and role as a trusted collaborator, we hope make us an attractive partner too. Uh, and this is, of course, nothing new. Since the Royal Society was founded in 1660, our fellows have found ways to work together across Europe despite political differences and dif difficult political times. So many of our fellows, Benjamin Franklin, Captain Cook, Humphrey Davy, they found ways to work across Europe, despite really difficult political circumstances, including many wars. Uh, so we must today continue this tradition by recognizing that science is a global endeavor, and that in order to be successful, any nation, country, no matter where, should not only work with close neighbors, but together work with collaborators around the world. Um, in 2019, I undertook a review in the UK, exploring some of these issues in more detail, uh, focusing on the fundamental importance, of course, of funding streams. Uh, so to build on the success of EU programs, we suggested, among other things, that we establish what we called an agility fund. Uh, two distinct strands, a proactive way of investing in international programs of significant potential benefit, and secondly, a more reactive fund, capturing opportunities that we can't foresee that arise unexpectedly uh, during interactions uh, around the world. So in addition, making the most of opportunities for partnerships at a bilateral and multilateral level also need to be explored. And this, of course, is part of the culture of, of the EU programs. Uh, we have continued to argue here that governments need to be bold in their ambitions for science and innovation. And the science community also needs to communicate on a continual basis the key ingredients for successful international scientific uh, collaboration. Uh, we want to create a, a strong reputation as a trustworthy partner, commitment to curiosity-driven research, of course, uh, but also creating opportunities for and supporting a diverse range of collaborations and international uh, partnerships. We're living at a time when science is more in the public eye than ever before, and where science advice to government around global issues such as COVID and climate change are listened to and part of the public debate. So in addition to funding and encouraging collaborations, we must also dem demonstrate the role that science can play in addressing these crises and the value of working together internationally and finding solutions across borders. Added to that, Scientists must, of course, reflect on the impact of their research beyond scientific goals and what we can do to contribute to policy and global challenges. So the vision of working together across borders underlines the critical importance of international collaboration and cooperation. It's the way we've been working in science for hundreds of years and the way we should look to in the future. Uh, UK association to Horizon Europe is a way of continuing to work in this spirit. Added to that, a strong stream of research funding will help build the trust that's required to sustain these partnerships into the future. So I look forward to the rest of the discussion.
Okay, I think that's a very positive uh, starting point. Uh, Jean-Pierre, uh, is your tone going to be the same? Are you going to be defiantly standalone on the continent of Europe or how are you going to see it? Well, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to contribute to this uh, discussion. Well, actually, I really want to start with uh, really uh, some facts, which is really the intensity of the exchanges between scientists uh, across the, the channel and, and further in the, in the UK uh, with the European uh, partners. And uh, for sure, uh, this has been uh, extremely um, successful cooperation over the years. And uh, I want to insist uh, upon one, one thing, which is really, this uh, is really a, a very broad collaboration that is not only in some areas, but uh, because of the strength of the UK in, um, and the high quality of researchers working in the UK in many different fields, uh, this collaboration was really touching basically every single topic. And uh, at the level of the European uh, Union framework programs, uh, of course, the UK was a very important participant and uh, actually a very successful participant, which of course was uh, one possible measure of the overall quality of the projects which were developed in, in the UK. So of course, uh, I can focus a bit more on the European Research Council because I, I was in charge of it. And I did pay a, a number of visits to uh, UK institutions, but also discuss with the various uh, groups, uh, uh, either the Royal Society and also um, the British Academy and uh, uh, the Russell Group and the other groups of uh, universities in the UK. And uh, each time uh, I could uh, witness uh, and, uh, and really even talk to scientists who, who could tell me how important it was for them, the, the, how, the, how much the collaboration with the uh, EU partners at that time, EU, uh, I would say, uh, with the UK, uh, was uh, for the development of our research. In the case of ERC, uh, by far, the UK was, uh, is the country which has received the largest number of grants. Of course, one has to be careful and take into account the size of the countries, but UK was doing uh, better than Germany, uh, which is a larger country, or France, which is a country of similar size. Um, and so this is uh, very, very uh, another proof, uh, sp specifically focused on ERC, of the, uh, of the quality of the research, uh, which is done in, in the UK. And as you know, in the case of uh, ERC, the, the only criteria is scientific quality and boldness of the proposal that uh, researchers submit to the ERC. Uh, one important uh, element, which I'm sure um, Sir Adrian is uh, fully aware of, is that uh, almost half of the grantees uh, from ERC working in the UK were actually non-British citizens for which, uh, of course, uh, many of them, it was very, very important that the issue of the continuing uh, presence in the UK was properly solved. Maybe one element I can bring uh, before I move on to, to, to the future is also one thing I made sure while I was uh, president of ERC was that uh, the main negotiator on, on, the U, on the EU side, Michel Barnier, was fully aware of this data concerning the strength and the value of the collaboration between the EU and the UK. And I must say, I was pleased to see that he was uh, interested in uh, having uh, full data and uh, making sure that he understood them. So, so I think, uh, in a sense, the immediate conclusion was uh, the great satisfaction when the, finally the, the Brexit deal was uh, publicized uh, uh, just uh, not even a year ago, just before Christmas last year that uh, indeed association to UK was part of the deal and that actually it was not just perspective, but even a negotiation had been pushed uh, very far. So now moving to, to the future, of course, uh, we know presently there are some difficulties in uh, getting to the next stage, which is really uh, actually implementing uh, what has been signed. And um, I, of course, hope uh, consistently with the previous attitude, but also the expectation I've heard from many um, EU scientists that indeed the, the present difficulties will be overcome and as soon as possible, because, you know, even a delay is, uh, would, be, would be negative. 
I would also join the, Sir Adrian in uh, really making the case again, because I think we need to make it all the time uh, how uh, important science has been uh, in history to bring together um, uh, really uh, the countries with uh, different uh, political perspectives. And from that point of view, of course, uh, the, the reason for this, of course, is uh, the fact that uh, uh, science is a, is a global common good, uh, and therefore it's uh, very important. But also, we know how critical it is for scientists to be confronted, but also to collaborate with people from uh, different countries uh, with different backgrounds and exchanges of students, uh, also uh, exchanging the best practices and, uh, of course, uh, publicizing results uh, is uh, part of the life of scientists and a very critical element we need to protect uh, when they are, I must say, appearing some uh, tendencies or even threats uh, to really cut off the world in several pieces. And uh, this is certainly for, for scientists altogether, something we, we don't welcome. And uh, of course, as uh, potential actors, uh, we should really bring um, our contribution to getting this um, not an obstacle for, for collaboration. So I'm really strongly hoping that uh, the present difficulties will be overcome. And uh, for, for the obvious reasons that uh, to me, it looks like uh, having the UK associated uh, to the uh, Horizon Europe, which is the framework program which you just started at the EU level, um, will indeed uh, be a, a reality uh, as soon as possible. And um, of course, this uh, is exactly the way we, we worked for exactly the uh, an objective for which we work for. And I think um, that, that's uh, the, something we uh, we hope uh, will indeed happen. Uh, and uh, as I said, happen very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to I'm going to take questions from the audience, but I'm going to abuse my position to ask the first question, if I may. I'd, I'd appreciate the two of you to, to broaden out your initial statement a little bit, because we're talking about the global context of, for science and research here, and the global context goes way beyond Europe and the UK. I think you've described a very successful uh, UK and uh, European collaboration in the past, and you're optimistic about positive collaboration in the future. But how do you both see the changes in the relative global competitiveness of Europe, so including the UK in terms of continent, and China in particular, and the US now compared to 10 years ago? I mean, what is the actual uh, scientific competitiveness challenge now for Horizon Europe? And is it different from what it was before there was that successful collaboration for Horizon 2020. Adrian, do you want to kick that off? I'll, I'll have a go. Um, so I think what's always been there is scale, uh, the scale of China, the scale of the United States, um, whether that be in terms of investment or population or economic markets or, or, or and so I think for many of us, um, not, going, not going back to George Orwell exactly, um, but you know, three blocks, the China, uh, America, and in that context, Europe as, as an entity, as it were, I think has always been uh, important. What has changed in recent years, um, I think the most dramatic change has probably been the scale of activity in China and the scale of investment uh, in China. Um, we used to say, rightly or wrongly, and perhaps rather prejudicedly, uh, that China wasn't great at um, creating and innovation and fundamental research, but you know, it was good at soaking up other people's ideas. I think that has changed dramatically. Uh, there is Chinese leadership in many, many areas uh, of science uh, that is now um, undeniable. So um, 
it, of course, in recent years, the other perturbation, the, the, the leadership of the United States and, and attitudes to science, um, which of course could potentially come back again, I guess, but they all point to the fact, whether it's scale, whether it's values, uh, whether it's kind of political um, attitudes, it points to the fact that the scale of what we can do joining up together in, in Europe is fundamentally important. Uh, even more so if you think of the UK at the moment where we're still waiting to get the association, um, you'll still have the rest of Europe, but the UK then begins to look uh, very exposed as, as a single single nation against these, these other blocks. Um, so I think the dominant thing for me, not not just generally, but in terms of, you know, I run the Turing Institute, National Institute in the UK for data science and AI. Um, the, the Chinese leaping ahead in areas of, of artificial intelligence, uh, partly because they have different cultural attitudes to the sharing of, of data. So they become world leaders in computer vision, whereas in many of our countries, there you know, be some suspicion of the use of data in those contexts. Um, but they, they all point back to a simple fact that in terms of scale uh, and being able to pool resources and compete in that, that world, um, standing together in Europe is fundamental. Okay, I think there's another element uh, for the EU itself in what you're saying, Adrian, because there needs to be better joining up, arguably, of the European plus the European member states' efforts as well, potentially. Yeah? Jean-Pierre, how do you see that? Well, I think it's uh, completely appropriate to to look at the issue in terms of uh, with a, uh, taking a global um, approach, because indeed, uh, I mean, the competition uh, it, since there are these uh, big blocks, um, uh, U.S. on one side and uh, China, but I think we should not forget also in Asia, other countries which are really investing massively in in research. Taos Korea is one of them. Japan has been with us for a number of years and so on. So I think uh, it's very important to get this uh, global view. And indeed, there are these uh, continental giants, uh, which of course pose uh, to, uh, a big challenge to Europe. And again, uh, for me, Europe, uh, I tend to see it uh, fully respect the decision of, uh, of UK to, to withdraw from the European Union. But um, association allows that we can still consider that uh, the, the two UK and, and, and EU work together. And uh, I think I completely echo what uh, Sir Adrian said concerning China. I think uh, too many people, in particular in the political level, tend to consider China as a country which is not a, a, a partner in terms of quality. And this is just not true anymore. I mean, they have consistently invested very large amounts of money they have trained uh, remarkably well some um, some of their best students, sometimes not in China, but now they are clearly able to bring a number of them back. And one uh, figure I think we should keep in mind, if you look at the share of the 1% uh, uh, most cited uh, papers in, in, uh, 20, in 2000, China was typically 1% to 2%. Now China is 20%. So you, you don't have such a transformation with how, without having, uh, which is, a, of course, a measure of the improvement of the quality. So it's not just the numbers, it's also the qualitative, it's not just quantitative. So I think this is something we, we need to keep in mind, and therefore this is uh, where the competition is. And from that point of view, that uh, globally uh, the EU has not been able to achieve the goal it gave itself, to reach 3% of GDP uh, by 2020 is not a good sign. And uh, from that point of view, uh, UK is uh, also not in, in, the, in the right league. And, uh, but of course, some European countries are in the right league, Germany and Sweden and, uh, and Finland and so on. Not my own country, France is still um, at 2.2% of GDP. So I think uh, this is the challenge we have to face. And I think we need to, to convince uh, the, um, the the countries that uh, uh, European countries and UK that more investment is critical, and the, this uh, extra investment will be even more efficient if we manage to work together. 
So I think the working together also brings, uh, without any extra um, bringing more money, but it brings also a, a higher level of competition, which in the end uh, results in a better competitiveness of the whole system. So I think uh, it's completely appropriate to think of these challenges and to argue that if we are not able to, to really live up to this challenge, uh, we, UK and EU, uh, be in trouble. Hmm. Okay. I think in a geopolitical commission context, Jean-Pierre, I hope that you made those views very clear uh, at the Brussels end. Okay, we okay. have plenty, we have we have plenty of questions coming in. There's the very first question, um, and let's just go straight for the jugular. No, this is from Zale Johnson, and Zale asks, "What I think is obvious what the answer is, but what are the key messages to the UK government and the EU Commission to finalise the association uh, of the UK to Horizon Europe?" And there's a linked question from Julia Lodge. Uh, what can individuals, so the people on this webinar elsewhere as well, do to expedite the current blockage? Jean-Pierre, what do you think? That's a very good question. Uh, actually, uh, for me, in a sense, um, uh, it would th that was the purpose, I think, of this uh, session, is to really put on the table the all the uh, obvious positive sides of the association that is um, being as um, in a sense as objective as possible of the uh, what is as to be gained by having this uh, work working together closely in the context of an association and i think uh, because clearly a number of things have become uh, i would say not only political but also uh, emotional so I think if we can bring back to rational thinking and measuring what are the big challenges we are facing, and the big challenges we are facing are indeed the competition with the, the big blocks. And if we are not organizing ourselves, uh, we will not be able to, to face these challenges. And on top of that, we know both uh, groups, I mean, UK and EU, have to, uh, to achieve remarkable transitions in terms of climate change, in terms of energy, and so on. And again, sharing this is going to be, uh, it's going to be a real challenge, uh, which, of course, other countries will be facing. But in our case, uh, we know also that uh, sharing our knowledge, sharing our capacities is going to make a difference. So I think uh, being as rational as possible is probably the best argument we, we can bring, because I don't think we can influence the politics or the emotion. Hmm. Okay, rational and calm then, no? Uh, Adrian? Well, very little to, to add to that, that admirably describes, I think, where, where we're at. Um, I think one, one can try and think of what are the best buttons to press for, for governments. Um, the beauty, truth and goodness of science might not work, but um, the absolute thing that Jean-Pierre has just referred to, the competitiveness argument, I think, is overwhelming. Um, because what governments do get, ours certainly gets it, it is the scale of challenge from, from China and, and the rest of Asia and, and the United States. Um, and that has proved a very effective way of influencing our own government. Um, I, I perhaps remind some people, it, it wasn't obvious that, the, the, that this, the government we have in the UK, you know, would, would enthusiastically go for association. That was an argument that needed to be won within the UK. And I think the competitiveness argument probably is, is the dominant one. Um, you know, research fundamental for, for innovation, innovation fundamental for prosperity. Uh, so I think we have to keep hammering um, that same argument, but it, it is really unfortunate that um, there's a politicization of the, the boundary conditions, as it were, for the discussion, um, which are absolutely um, irrelevant, to be honest. Um, issues about uh, Northern Ireland um, just really have nothing to do with the competitiveness in a global scale of, for both the UK and Europe. So 
Um, it, I don't think it's very productive to shout nonsense at politicians, but I think everyone listening here will have their own um, contacts and ways of influence. And just the simple thing of disassociating the rationality of our working together cooperatively in terms of our world competitiveness, uh, disassociate that from, from maybe not petty political issues, but issues that have absolutely nothing to do with those major concerns. Hmm. I think in practice, if I may add something myself, it would be very important to give the message, I don't know if you share this, the two of you, to the scientists, to the innovators, that they should, the UK ones, should now be applying to the open calls as if uh, there was association. Uh, because if they do not, uh, then there is something lost tangibly already, no? And I think that there is uh, a UK financial guarantee uh, that would facilitate that. So my message, and I, I'll just check it out with you, is that the UK people that want to be part of Horizon Europe should be applying now as if the association was ratified. Is that correct, Adrian? Uh, that is the message we've, we've continually pervade, but I think we, we do have to be realistic. As this all drifts on through time, you know, people will begin to get very worried. The, 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 the rhythms of annual calls and funding and guarantees of the funding, um, it, it creates a great deal of uncertainty. And that uncertainty will affect, I think, the way that, that people organize themselves to apply. But I think Jean-Pierre referred to it somewhat earlier. The, the, the major uncertainties are in people and people committing themselves to, 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 to jobs, to moving. Um, you know, these, the, the sci people's scientific lives aren't year to year, are they? they? You know, you think five, three year, five years, you have to have those horizons and you have to have those sustainabilities and certainties. Um, and I think even though the, the, the rational thing is, you know, to keep going, keep applying, one has to be real psychologically. The more that this drifts on, it is affecting people's decision making. Yeah, I think you've both been very clear about the need to resolve as soon as possible. OK, I have a question from Malcolm Harbour. So I know Malcolm as a former eminent uh, member of the European Parliament. I think now you're not that Malcolm because it's no longer appropriate. Um, but you're asking a very specific question about the innovation programme. So the UK in the negotiations decided, uh, Malcolm says, not to participate in that element. And he asks for the view of the panellists whether they think that was the correct decision. And perhaps you will be more interesting on, you know, what actually will be missed out by not being involved in that. Jean-Pierre, what do you think? Well, first of all, uh, as you can imagine, I'm not as uh, aware of uh, the exact situation concerning innovation as uh, I am for ERC. But still, yes. uh, since from the very beginning, uh, the ERC has uh, tried and, and continues uh, to, to really have a, a quite close collaboration with the European Innovation Council. So we have been discussing with the board in the past, and uh, I know the, these discussions continue. And therefore, uh, we we know the key element uh, for actually both countries is uh, this uh, disruptive innovation. And we know disruptive innovation is extremely closely connected to, to scientific research. And of course, the key element and the strategic choice made by the creation of the European Innovation Council was to make sure that there is nothing lost between the, the uh, high level of research and uh, innovation. Of course, there are other components to innovation, which I'm not uh, neglecting at all, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a fact that indeed a number of disruptive innovation are very closely connected uh, with, with um, very high level research. So, so I think from that point of view, I think uh, it's, uh, of course, I, I, it's not possible for me to comment why the UK government uh, took the position it took. Uh, I know some parts of the program of, uh, on innovation are still accessible to the UK uh, to, to UK applicants, uh, but it's only part of it. Um, so I think uh, 
this process is just beginning. So it's uh, very difficult at this moment to know exactly um, uh, how it's going to go. I mean, we, we know, I think the initiatives taken look to me quite good. And as I told you, we did accompany them uh, in, the, in, in the best way we could from the point of view of the ERC. And uh, as I said, the uh, collaboration between EIC and ERC has been uh, definitely one of our priorities on, at the level of the ERC Scientific Council. And I know it was shared by the, uh, by the uh, European Innovation Council. So in a sense, um, thinking of uh, research innovation as a continuum and making sure that the continuum does function as a continuum, for me, is very important. Okay. Adrian? Do you have a view uh, on this? Well, I'm not, I'm not well cited on the intricacies of, of the debates um, and decision making that led to the current situation. What I can say um, in the UK is, of course, at the Royal Society, we, we would continually raise the flag of the, the fundamental importance of research and discovery research for innovation. So we would not wish to see them in two separate boxes. However, uh, to some extent, I think that is on the agenda. You think of um, everybody sees that cooperation in research is obviously a good thing. Uh, whereas as you move to innovation, I'm not saying this is my view, as you move to innovation, you, you move more from cooperation to uh, competition, perhaps. Um, also, I think there were complicated thing about areas of exclusion uh, as you moved into the innovation space. So I think we, we are where we are. Um, we are arguing within the UK for that continuum of research and innovation being seen in that way. Um, a recent announcement from the government, that the innovation agenda really is very important to them and they're doubling the investment in our um, agency Innovate UK, which is part of the UKRI scene. Um, but I, I, I really don't know. It was interesting that in the public space, um, the, the visibility of arguments about research were very, very clear. Um, I think that many fewer people were understanding or involved in the discussions on the Innovation Council. Okay. Yeah, I think that was a quite hidden discussion too. I am going to pick up what you said there about competition, Adrian, to pick up a question from Thomas Jorgensen, who is Senior Policy Coordinator in the European University Association. Uh, Thomas asks um, that, well, he says, first of all, that research is not a zero-sum game. I think that picks up your remarks very well. And then he asks, when we say competition, so research competition, what are we competing for? And he suggests talent, strategic technologies, and I would add, perhaps in a more political context, impact in terms of possible solutions, I hope. Jean-Pierre, how do you pick that up? Well, uh, first of all, uh, to, uh, we, we stressed a lot uh, the importance for scientists to collaborate. And, and of course, we were right in doing so. But actually, every scientist know that uh, they are just uh, knows that uh, every scientist knows that uh, they are competing with others. So, in the sense, for scientists, the combination uh, cooperation competition is something that they are facing uh, almost every day. And, and but this is seen. Uh, positively in the sense that uh, competition is really um, something to stimulate you and to uh, to tell you that maybe there are other ways of doing things and you should look into them and uh, and you have to see this as a challenge and so on uh, so so from that point of view i think uh, we we have to be careful not to believe that uh, research is some kind of a protected area where competition doesn't exist that's not true that's not true at all but still this being said it, it does mean that it prevents uh, quite uh, intense uh, cooperation. So, so I think uh, this is one argument I tend to put forward systematically with politicians uh, to, to just copy for uh, research um, the, the, uh, the, the level of the meaning and, and the, the consequences of competition in the economic world is just not appropriate. Because I think uh, for scientists, it's so critical 
that we view the world as as one and not as uh, different blocks uh, which are really just uh, fighting each other without uh, any connection because i think we we have to rely on uh, on uh, really uh, the knowledge uh, the criticism and so on from many different parts of the world so now to come to to what is the meaning the the question of uh, thomas jorgensen um, on uh, strategic uh, priorities and things like this i think for the moment uh, what uh, strikes me is uh, really for the world there are a number of uh, challenges and priorities which are just imposed on us by the situation we are in so climate change is not something a country say well forget it i'll take care of it uh, in 30 years no every country has to face that um, basically part of it is also the struggle with the energy uh, struggle for energy is every country is facing it we know we have transformed the way we access energy probably we have to also reduce the way we spend energy uh, or at least uh, economize the way we, we we use energy and so on so it looks to me at the moment the challenges are so global and all countries are, have to face them that the part which even if some technologies will be um, really uh, better developed in, in some countries than in others and then it can give a competitive edge still uh, we the, the challenges we face are just the same so even from that point of view making sure that we share good solutions is going to be something inevitable okay Adrian, do you want to say something? Um, well, echo the, those general thoughts. I, I think I think competition for talent, um, it, it's both competition and collaboration. So we, col we could collaborate to ensure the freest possible movement of scientists and the ease for people to, to, to move around, but then compete for the talent. So they're not exclusive. Um, on strategic choices, um, I think it's where Jean-Pierre ended up, that we can agree on the global challenges, but individual com countries might mean they've got some advantage in some particular technologies. So I don't know if it's, it's widely known. Um, we've just set up in the UK an entirely new office, the Office for Science and Technology Strategy, which is there to try and identify um, the technologies or the themes in which um, the UK might feel it has competitive advantage, and this might then influence um, levels of investment. Um, and this office is just being launched. And coincidentally, I am chairing a meeting this afternoon where our government chief scientific advisor, Patrick Valance, is going to outline uh, to a very large audience um, what he thinks the office is about. And people are going to ask questions like, what does it mean to have strategic advantage in a technology? So later this afternoon, I might be able to answer this question. Hmm. Okay, good question. Good answers, I think. There's a question from Martin Ewell. I hope I'm saying that approximately right. He's from the University of Manchester. And he says something I don't know, perhaps you know, that the EU has some 20 treaties on science and technology cooperation with state entities around the world. And he asked specifically, will the UK's anticipated association with Horizon Europe enable the UK to contribute to this cooperation? Do you know the answer to that, Adrian? Um, I don't think I do in, in, a, in a simple sense. Um, you know, obviously, we all know, in addition to formal associations, there are all sorts of third party uh, and multilateral possibilities, but I, I don't know um, the, the, the actual technical answer to that question. Sorry. Yeah, me neither. Jean-Pierre, do you know? Well, the only part I can uh, rep report on is, of course, the agreements that the ERC has signed with a number of agencies over the world. I think there are 12 countries uh, in which we have signed agreements with uh, agencies uh, to make it possible for researchers from these countries to visit ERC teams. So, so of course, being associated automatically makes this uh, available. 
Um, these are not huge amounts of money, but in terms of, uh, of course, uh, strengthening the cooperation, and we discussed that uh, quite a bit, uh, these, uh, these uh, agreements are quite important. And, and some countries are really putting a lot of effort into it. I can mention uh, South Korea, for example, Japan, and actually three different agencies in Japan have signed an agreement with the ERC to, to make it possible for their researchers to, to visit ERC teams. Brazil is also very actively developing uh, activities along that. So, so these are, but I'm sorry, I can only... Cette carte. No, I think the music is still there. I, some, somebody here, Ben Upton, is uh, suggesting in a quite polemical way, Ben, um, he's saying this, he's asking this question. Does the European Commission's willingness to use Horizon politically change the programme's attractiveness for non-EU countries or EU countries, I could say? But I don't know if we would agree, if I would agree with the premise of that question, um, that it's, shall we say, a unilateral politicisation. I think both of the speakers in the beginning uh, said quite a great deal about the building of trust and uh, it takes two to trust or two to tango. But on this le relative attractiveness uh, question, Adrian, can you pick that up? I'm not sure I fully understood the, um, the premise of the question. I think it's accusatory, unilaterally accusatory of the, on the yeah. European Commission's uh, well, and I think we've I, been studiously not blaming yeah, anybody. I, would suggest I think the, um, the one thing that will not aid uh, re resolution of the current impasse will be uh, blame games and pointing fingers. Uh, so I think given the audience we have here, the best thing in, in non-emotional, rational terms would be for everyone listening every contact they have that potentially could lead to influence is just to keep reasserting the nonsense of, of linking to a political impasse something which is so obviously of mutual benefit to us all yeah i think so i don't think we need to extend that one um chiara mazzone who's a senior eu affairs advisor for vodafone points out that the UK is guaranteeing the first wave of Horizon Europe, UK, which is true, is the first two years, I think, um, for any UK-based winners in terms of the open calls. Um, and she asks, do you think this has an opportunity to be prolonged? And, you know, my comment for that is, if we're still in this position in two years' time, that seems very wishful. Adrian, how do you say, how do you... Well, we, we have you? had conversations with um, our, our ministers uh, in the UK, and I don't think you'd be surprised that they are extremely non-committal about longer-term uh, assurances uh, and guarantees. So you can ask the question of what do we think, but it would be pure guesswork and my own guess is that people are going to get increasingly impatient and disillusioned if this drags on yeah i think that's true there's a question here which is absolutely for you jean pierre it's from pascal massiani so the question is specifically whether the uk is in the same situation as switzerland regarding the 2021 ERC calls? I think on one level, yes, on another level, no. How do you answer that? The, the situation is, is a different one. The, the situation is a different one. There is an echo somewhere. I don't know why, but... Um, 
Okay, so I think the situation is a different one because uh, for sure the uh, UK um, UK based scientists uh, can apply to ERC for the moment without any limitation. The, the difficulty may come at the moment where uh, uh, the ERC is ready to sign a contract and then to sign a contract, of course, the association has to be effective. Uh, for the Switzerland, uh, because of the decision of the uh, Swiss uh, Council to the Conseil Federal to withdraw, to block the negotiation at some point. Then, uh, for example, for the advance grants call, the uh, Swiss-based Switzerland-based applicants uh, were considered ineligible, so mm -hmm. which is a different uh, situation. So, from that point of view, uh, there is uh, a difference. Uh, but of course, uh, as uh, Sir Adrian said uh, rightly, I mean it cannot go on for very long because in the case of VRC, for example, the starting grants uh, are really coming to a moment where uh, the ERC will be ready to sign contracts. And so, of course, uh, for the contracts to, to, for having the possibility to sign the contract, of course, there must be a legal basis and the legal basis is association. Yeah. So there is a formal difference between the two. Yeah, exactly. I think that's very clear. Thank you for that. We have time for one more question, and I'm going to apologize in advance to all of the questions I have not picked. So the last question I pick is from Juliet Lodge again, and she asks a very interesting question. How can we best sustain EU values in research? I think this applies to the UK as well, Adrian. In the face of Chinese and Asian advances, especially in artificial intelligence. And Julia posits that there may be a difference in appreciation of ethical issues. And then she asks, um, how can we take these potential differences of ethics or culture into account in any association in, at project level, I guess, uh, with third countries? How do you pick that up? Adrian first and then Jean-Pierre. And then I'll ask you both to make your concluding remarks. So if we take attitudes to data and privacy, uh, the culture in China is very different from most of the, the culture across Europe. So how can one begin to find a common ground for conversation that somehow finds a way of meeting in the middle rather than polarizing the cultural differences. And in the case of artificial intelligence, uh, if, you, if we think in terms of artificial intelligence being used uh, to drive things or products or cars or whatever, um, we immediately then have to think of international trade. And where we then can find some common cause for conversation will be on things like standards. Because if you wish to trade and sell things with your artificial intelligence in it, in a standards regulated market, uh, you would have to follow the standards. And so I think there are a lot of interesting ways in which we can get into that space while totally respecting, because it's pointless to do otherwise, that we have different cultures. Excellent. Jean-Pierre? Excuse me. <clears throat> I think Sheridan is uh, very right in pointing out the importance of um, negotiation about standards. This is something which is uh, not, uh, not always so visible from the general public, but it's, of course, a major issue for industry, industry people and, and also for future developments. Now, uh, to, come, uh, to come back to, to the ethical dimension, actually, one has to be aware that this difference in ethics regulation already exists within Europe. And actually, at the ERC, we, we are, um, of course, uh, there is some agreement at EU level, but uh, very often um, it's, uh, um, it can differ uh, from what is the national regulation. And uh, so, so I think uh, this uh, difference in the way you and et ethics, um, and in particular in connection with uh, biology or medicine, is understood, uh, is a, a very subtle subject for which, uh, for the moment, uh, of course, uh, one has to be extremely careful and uh, 
um, attentive to any changes here and there. Because, uh, as I said, uh, and we had been faced within the ERC itself with the situations where people completely on good faith proposed something which, from the ethical point of view, was fine for their in the relation with their national regulations, which was, which was not for the EU uh, rule, because some countries in, in Europe were stricter the, in terms of ethics. So, so I think this is uh, something, of course, extremely important because of the uh, practical consequences. And uh, and but uh, it's it's a very subtle thing which need to needs to be monitored. And part of the difficulty of monitoring it, of course, is the capacity of uh, of science that is provided by science changes all the time. For example, something some data which at some point preserve really the uh, i mean really keeps the the anonymity uh, maybe if you make some progress in uh, uh, data mining then something which at some point was anonymity was preserved then the next stage it's not preserved anymore so how do you store data in such a way that you can adapt to the new developments of science which uh, actually allows you to go um, to to really be more uh, intrusive uh, of course, not with the purpose of being intrusive, just because the, your capacity has, has grown. So you see, this is an extremely important issue, but uh, which is a very subtle one and really needs to be monitored by extremely competent people, uh, not only of um, moral standards, but also of uh, technical and scientific uh, capacities. Yeah. And... I think we're already seeing the beginning of regulation, not just standardization uh, in some technologies, no? Okay, that was very, very good. Okay, you have two minutes each now to share your thoughts at the end of this session. So, Jean-Pierre, I'm going to ask you to kick it off. Two minutes, what thoughts do you want to leave your audience with? Well, first of all, I hope that our discussion has been useful. And I, I hope people have felt that uh, I'm very close to Sir Adrian on, on the objective. So I think uh, this will give them uh, imagination to uh, be able to fight this uh, battle for association uh, with uh, renewed energy and, and creativity. Because I think um, my tendency is always that uh, I always hope that uh, Rational, uh, rational arguments are the strongest thing we can put on the table. So that's why I really um, try to make the case that uh, trying to bring the issue back to rational arguments is probably the, the strongest way we can um, uh, have this battle going on. And again, Excellent. thank you for the invitation. Excellent. Thank you very much. Adrian? Well, I'll, I'll say thank you first for organizing this event and, and the invitation. Uh, I think really to repeat the, the core current concern, which is as time goes on and we fail to resolve the political impasse that is getting in the way of what Jean-Pierre has continued to refer to as the, the rational thing we should be doing in, in for global humanity, um, two things. One, the, there's a practical car crash just in terms of funding and people and careers and collaborations. And I think what worries me as much um, will be the erosion of uh, relationships. Um, Brexit uh, was a starting point which required us in the UK uh, to think that we needed, therefore, to work harder at relationships. Um, this is yet another obstacle. Um, so I think everybody listening in, any form of influence they have to pick up Jean-Pierre's uh, rational baton, um, please do so. Okay. I think you have very similar views and you are both illustrations of what there is to gain by perpetuating the collaboration between Europe and the UK in the research and science area. I would suggest that the EU-UK forum sends uh, these proceedings both to Lord Frost and to Mara Shevchevic so that they understand what are the rational arguments for uh, concluding 
any discussions that they need to have on these issues as soon as possible. Um, I think everybody stands to gain from that. Thank you so much, the two of you, and thank you to the audience. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.